do roll call real quick for us? Oh, she must be. Okay. Barber? Here. Balswick? Here. George? Here. Jorgensen? Here. Lee? Roffler? Here. Vento? Here. Johnson? Here. Thank you everybody for joining us today for their, our um, December audit committee meeting. Um, with that, we'll, uh, again, without any objections or any changes to the agenda, um, we could just approve the agenda. Um, are there any changes or additions, edits that anyone would suggest? All right, then again, without objection, the agenda is approved. Move on to item three, which is approval of the minutes. We've got a minute uh, that everyone's been uh, mailed out for your review from the October 26th meeting of the audit committee. Uh, could I have a motion and a second for approval? Vento moves approval. Moved by Vento. Is there a second? Second by second. Barber. Seconded by Barber. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, will you please call the roll, Tammy? Barber? Aye. Galswick? Aye. George? Aye. Jorgensen? Aye. Lee? Rothler? Aye. Vento? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Thank you, everybody, for approval of the minutes. We'll now move on to uh, the business portion of our agenda. We have two items. We have program evaluation and audit strategic plan for 2022, 2022 through 2025. And I'll turn this over to Matt. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, good to see you all virtually again. Um, got a couple agenda items for me to start with. The first one is the approval of our uh, strategic plan for the next, uh, between 2022 and 2025. Um, as you likely recall, uh, I went over this plan in, in some detail at our October meeting um, and shared it with uh, both uh, members of the committee and also executive leadership over the past few weeks. Um, really haven't had a lot of uh, feedback or changes, positive generally, if I've gotten any feedback. Um, I just point attention to one bullet that I added uh, between meetings um, and the first objective, it's just the last bullet about continue to lead in the introduction of best practices related to ethics compliance. Uh, just to reflect work that we've been really doing for, for quite a while and we'll, we'll plan to continue to do just an, an omission in the original plan. Uh, so I won't go any, go through this in detail again, just for time's sake, but I'm happy to take any questions or you know discuss any points in detail. Does the, thanks Matt, does the committee have any questions about um, the program evaluation and audit strategic plan? Hearing none, I just wanna thank you, Matt, too, for pointing out that addition and going over it with me. I know everybody's had a chance to look at it. Um, hear no input or edits or changes at this point. I would move on then to uh, roll call for acceptance or adoption of the um, evaluation and audit strategic plan. Tammy, do you want your roll call? I'm sorry, did we get the motion and approval? Oh, I'm sorry, there was no motion. I'm sorry, my fault. Is there a motion to approve uh, the audit plan? Sure, right. so, so moved. Okay, great, is there a second? Vento seconds. Thank you very much. Now, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, then we'll do the roll call vote. Arbor? Aye. Galswick? Aye. George? Aye. Jorgensen? Aye. Lee? Roffler? Aye. Ento? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Thank you, everyone. That is unanimously adopted. Now we'll turn over to our risk assessment and audit plan for 2022. And again, Matt. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, thanks again. Uh, so this is the, um, the the other business item. This is really one of the main business items this committee does uh, throughout the year, and that is uh, fulfilling um, 
the audit committee charter responsibility of approving our audit plan for the year. Uh, the IIA standards that we adhere to uh, do require that we uh, complete a risk-based audit plan and that it's approved by our, our committee. Um, we actually bring this uh, periodically for just a reminder for those of you in the committee and those of you in the audience. We we bring this um, actually quite a few of our meetings. It's it's really more of a fluid plan than it is a fix one year um, only look at it once a year type plan. Uh, so we do. Uh, bring it throughout the year for updates and additions, deletions. Uh, but this is this one is more of the substantial, um, you know, cleaning up, full risk assessment of, of, of example of this, this plan. So um, I'm gonna walk a little bit through the methodology and some of the risks that we highlighted, uh, go through the plan. And then there's a piece at the end that I wanna highlight for the committee that will be a little bit more focused on how uh, these committee meetings can go will go uh, through the year. So I'm just going to see if I can bear with me. I am um, can anyone can you uh, uh, chair? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Let's go to presentation mode. Uh, just a note from from me. Uh, I think this is maybe the eighth committee meeting we've done virtually, and this is the fifth different place I've done the meeting. This one being in my office with a new webcam. So, it's a uh, one of these things. Learning to work in the office remotely um, is a bit of a can be a bit of a challenge and something new. Um, okay, so the methodology, how we complete our risk assessment, um, we look at uh, MMB's control environment self assessment tool is one of the factors. One of the exercises we do as an audit team. Um, for those of you who don't know what this is, there's a requirement, um, or at least has been, uh, for executive branch agencies of the state to complete this tool. And there's some some resources that MMB provides to state agencies. Um, given our um, existence as kind of a quasi state agency, we don't exactly get those resources, but we felt like this is a useful uh, way to approach. Um, uh, one of the steps in our in our risk assessment. So it goes over kind of an overview of the organization in terms of identifying some key risk factors. Um, we uh, create questions based on risk. Uh, we meet with um, really, you know, somewhere between 40 and 60 uh, meetings uh, with all of our staff with senior leaders across the organization to discuss the risks in their department um, and then look at uh, 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 risk and scoring based on six factors. Uh, the factors that we consider are financial significance, external internal risks, IT complexity, equity impact, which is something we started to do last year, uh, time since last audit, and directional change. So we generally ask questions about these and assign uh, a risk uh, score that comes up with a composite score. Just a note about the scores, I think they're, they're a tool. It isn't like we take the top 10 items on the risk list that score the highest and just focus on those. Uh, we still consider um, a range of, of, of projects that, that touch risk levels that are both high and medium and low. Um, but this is an again, it's a tool for us to frame our work and, and um, determine what um, what is the most impactful work we can do in a year. Um, so a few words about the general risk environment. Um, and I'm going to go through this a little quicker than I have past years. Again, I'm going to mention at the end kind of why I'm trying to. Uh, make this a little briefer of a conversation. So I guess the first uh, thing to point out is just COVID-19. As, as everybody's aware, this has been a, a um, as we say in incident command, pivot um, uh, culture. Uh, it seems to have taken twists and turns that nobody could have anticipated two years ago, and we're still certainly living with it today uh, with new variants of concern um, on the horizon. Uh, the, continue, the pandemic continues to impact council operations. Um, uh, especially in things like ridership um, and some of the safety policies that we are adhering to in our workplaces. And obviously that uh, most of our uh, staff that works in office environments continues to telework and has for the past um, nearly going on two years. Um, we still continue to implement an incident command structure and uh, re respond to the pandemic's realities and we'll continue to do so into 2022. Um, Equity at the council, the council continues to focus on equity, um, both as a risk and an opportunity. Um, each division has, uh, has determined uh, different ways that they are responding to equity, Metro Transit, Environmental Services, 
as well as regional administration, uh, um, human resources opportunity, uh, taking the lead in terms of identifying ways the council can uh, create a more equitable environment for our employees, our, the region, and, uh, and especially in the world of contracting in terms of how we select vendors for uh, work and uh, ensuring that the, that is distributed in an equitable, equitable way. Um, economic trends, um, certainly the COVID pandemic has continued to affect the economy um, in, in some good and some bad ways. Uh, our budgets are actually in, in pretty good. As many of you probably saw, the state budget forecast last year was, or just last week came out with a very positive outlook, a $7.7 .7 billion surplus. Um, that certainly has some trickle down effects to us at the council and in general are uh, due to um, that outlook, uh, the, the bounce back in the economy, and also a lot of significant federal dollars that have come into the council. Uh, budgets are actually uh, in, a, in a pretty good spot right now. There does, however, remain uncertainty um, with the economy going forward, again, with the twists and turns of the pandemic and, and uncertainty of how the broader economy will go and how that might affect our revenue sources. Uh, certainly something to uh, maintain focus on in 2022. Uh, one of the acute impacts of the pandemic has been staffing, um, not unlike every other organization in the, in the global economy. We've had um, some changes in terms of how, um, how easy or difficult it could be to recruit qualified candidates. Um, certainly, um, certain positions have been more challenging than others, and we continue to deal with uh, trying to ensure that we have a, an adequate workforce to provide the service, um, service levels that we expect to provide to the region. Um, as I mentioned, we not only are we delaying our return to the office, but uh, many other organizations are doing the same. Uh, many of our, uh, of our uh, downtown businesses have also delayed their return to the office, which certainly has an impact on, on our transit uh, service and demand. Um, so we're continuing to deal with that. Uh, supply chains, uh, global supply chains have affected things like uh, chips, which affects the number of things we buy. Uh, certainly, we've had pandemic supplies and a number of other impacts in terms of supply chains that uh, have the effect of things we purchase and a lot of with, with uh, capital projects um, in, a, in a wide range of things we actually purchase. Uh, there have been, have been effects and are potential effects going forward. And uh, additionally, inflation is another factor that we're, um, we're dealing with just like everyone else. Um, as I mentioned, budget at the state government level is positive, but there are still a number of issues uh, that we're working through with uh, the legislature and we'll focus on the coming session. Uh, we continue to focus on things like fair evasion, um, administrative citations and funding for um, some of our uh, transit projects and inflow, inflow and infiltration and parks and trails. Um, so a lot to keep a, an eye on with regard to the state legislature. Um, and the last area I want to highlight is cybersecurity. Um, cyber attacks using social engineering to deploy ransomware are continuing an increasing threat, especially in remote work environments, which we, we continue to maintain for a lot of our staff. I'll also highlight that given the role the council has in operating critical infrastructure, such as wastewater treatment and transit systems, um, adherence to cybersecurity frameworks such as the NIST framework are essential and continue to monitor and assess our own uh, ability to respond and mitigate threats in, in the cyber world. Uh, just kind of reiterate uh, to some of our specific uh, threats to our specific uh, risks to our specific um, business lines. Again, uh, ridership continues to affect our, our transit demand and, and, um, and our services. And also um, we are continuing to uh, expand our system with a number of capital projects, uh, including the Southwest Light Rail Line, uh, the Orange Line, which just opened a few weeks ago, uh, and the Purple and Gold Lines, as well as a number of uh, um, arterial bus rapid transit systems. Um, just a note on community development. Well, uh, the risk profile in community development hasn't changed a lot over the last few years. There is a um, uh, there has been some adjustments with how we're uh, dealing with some of our housing units due to the pandemic, and we do have a new capital budget that we're using to acquire additional properties. Uh, environmental services uh, continues to monitor regu regulatory changes 
and uh, also has had some unique challenges with uh, the nature of a 24-7, 365 environment with uh, a lot of staff that have to work in close proximities. So the, uh, maintaining staffing levels and appropriate to uh, deliver the service that we absolutely have to provide uh, has, been a, has been a key risk for that area. Well, that's, that is basically just the summary of very high level of risks. Um, moving on to uh, some of the areas that we take into account is our external audit environment, um, in part because this affects you know, how we look at uh, the, the assurance coverage provided to the council, um, and, and, and in part uh, drives what we do for our audit plan. So um, some of the key uh, external audits, this isn't a comprehensive list, but some of the key ones um, are annual state audit, uh, we'll start again as it always does in the spring, um, and you'll be kept apprised of that through entrance and exit conferences at the committee level. Uh, we will plan on having an FTH for annual review this year. We've just been notified um, that we need to start submitting documentation for the triennial review. This is a comprehensive, um, typically every three years, but it, we're, we're four years out from our last one due to the pandemic um, that covers just about every area we have in transit, um, financial capacity, procurement, et cetera. Um, and will be a pretty significant uh, effort for the team uh, responding um, sometime during the year. We're just finishing another FTA review on recovery funds. Uh, this really just has to do with the support we provide the FTA for our, our draws. Um, a little subtle difference that uh, the, some of the funding we got through uh, uh, the CARES Act and other sources uh, was was used for operating funds a little different than some of the some of the draws we've used before, which primary which typically primarily focus on capital. So we're working with the FTA and the, their contractor on uh, closing that audit out right now. Um, and uh, we have an IRS general obligations wastewater review of our bonding process. Uh, that's pretty. We've actually just finished one a few months ago. And we're starting a new one now. So uh, one other note um, that we've. There was some attention with the Office of the Legislative Auditor around Southwest Light Rail that we responded to. It was not an external audit, it was just an inquiry uh, that we've uh, worked with the OLA to provide them with some information. Uh, the OLA drafted uh, a memo, um, but did not decided not to engage in any audit work this year. However, it does remain on the table as a possibility for uh, the next year down the road. Um, but I'll, I'll let you know if we uh, have anything more formal from the Office of Legislative Auditor. Um, we continue to work with uh, Aon, who is a partner of ours uh, uh, on a range of reviews, uh, looking at our, our absence management process, some cybersecurity work, um, and other things uh, that uh, we're taking into account in terms of you know, coverage uh, that will affect some of the areas that we focus on in those spaces. Uh, so we'll continue to keep track of that. And the council has used Pink Consulting for a number of uh, diversity and equity practices, uh, training, seminars, um, a number of different avenues, um, um, and continues to um, in 2022. All right, so getting on to our audit plan, and I'll go through this pretty briefly, uh, just in the interest of time, but I'm certainly happy to answer questions or you know take those offline. Uh, you know, we put out um, this this audit plan. Typically, we used to say in the audit plan accounted for 75% of our time. We had a lot of ideas and inquiries this year, um, and so I actually changed the note because I think this probably accounts for more than 100% of our time. Um, the reason I was comfortable doing that, we we tend to um, every year put together a plan, and some you know we, at the beginning of every audit, we always do what's called an engagement level risk assessment. Um, and, you know, things change during the year. There's there's additional audit work that external auditors do. There's, um, you know, things change in terms of the priorities of, you know, the business units. Um, so I think it's okay to have a little bit more than we probably plan on doing in a year. Um, we'll prioritize as we go and certainly work through our engagement level risk assessment process to uh, make sure that we're working on priority work. But just uh, so you're aware, this is, this is probably more than one year's uh, work. Um, looking at council wide, uh, looking at some work around our, our, our MCUP program. Uh, that's a, a purchasing program around uh, highlighting uh, underutilized businesses. Uh, one of the 
reasons to focus on this program is because it doesn't have really any audit coverage. We have a similar program called the Disadvantaged Business Entities through that is audited by the Federal uh, Transit Administration uh, regularly. Uh, this program isn't, so uh, that's the, why the focus on that one. Uh, contract administration, grants administration, um, IT general controls, uh, working through a um, internal control questionnaire. Uh, there probably will be a few questions at a time to try to get around to a lot of different IT general controls. Uh, SCADA, um, for those of you who are familiar with the acronym, uh, it really just is our systems uh, systems technology around our light rail systems and our wastewater uh, treatment systems. It's the IT that goes around to make the systems work. Uh, so the SCADA is kind of a fancy acronym, but uh, there's some tools out there um, that the federal government has has put out to uh, um, do a review um, that, um, to some extent, the businesses are already working on. So a little, a little bit to be determined in terms of what our work would be there. Um, within environmental services, capital projects, post implementation review, uh, looking at facility, facility security in a similar way we did with Metro Transit last year, um, environmental health safety compliance, operations support services post move inventory. Um, at Metro Transit, looking at body camera implementation and use. Uh, just a note about that one. Going forward, starting in 2023, our state auditor uh, partners will likely be um, tasked with doing a regular uh, statutory every two year review of our body cams. Uh, we thought it'd be good for us as an internal audit team to do this um, in 2022 ahead of that first state audit, um, in part to get a sense of how well the, the implementation is going and also give our team uh, experience with how the body cam system works. Um, uh, police evidence and asset inventory, um, is a, that's a fairly routine audit that we've done in past years. Um, asset preservation and management, uh, a cash room review, which is something that's again, uh, fairly routine for us. Uh, gold line pay application, uh, and uh, obviously continue work with Southwest uh, Light Rail. In regional administration, we're looking at uh, payment processing collection, particularly the, the time it takes to, to make those payments, uh, paper check processing, uh, data retention and records management, our job classification process. It's also known as our, our HAY process for uh, determining uh, positions within the council, uh, employing positions. Uh, technology asset inventory, uh, user administration or identity management audit, um, and affirmative action reporting and data migration. There's been some changes in terms of how we uh, collect and, and really process uh, some of the data we use for affirmative action reporting. Uh, just some special projects. This is kind of our non audit work plan, and, and we're actually kind of um, as a tail. We're still looking at a few additional ads in this in the space, but uh, continue to update our audit manual as we've been doing for the last few years. Um, we are um, still on the hook to do a peer audit review of another department. Uh, this is something that we had somebody come in and do our peer review now a couple of years ago. Um, and haven't had to return the favor. I think we had a couple times where we were supposed to, but it was uh, delayed by the pandemic. But I'm, I'm leaving that on just because it could happen at any time. Uh, continue work around fraud awareness, um, updates to our investigative and fraud policies and procedures. And we are right now working on a, a NAVEX ethics point program enablement, which is really just a, um, we've had our ethics point program for reporting complaints uh, and violations of uh, employment policies uh, for about one year, and uh, we have a, our contractor back in to work with the users of the system to try to make some improvements and think about um, how we can best use the system to uh, do some reporting um, to various uh, groups. So it's been a, a fruitful project so far and expect some good results out of that one. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing, I can figure out how to do that and talk a little bit about um, our committee meetings coming up in the next year. So in the last page of the uh, risk assessment and audit plan, there's a, a plan for our four meetings that we typically have with the audit committee. And one of the things, just some feedback I got from some of the committee members was um, it'd be helpful for them to hear from a little bit more, not just from the audit department, but some of the key managers around the council about risks, uh, controls, governance, et cetera. 
Um, and so what I'm proposing is to allow about 30 minutes of each meeting in the next year to have a discussion around a very one uh, one topic. Um, and I haven't just to be clear, I've talked to some of the people on the list, uh, Craig Bantz, for example, about IT, but I haven't talked to everybody. We'll kind of figure out what the schedule looks like, um, what the topics will be. I'd like to have something like 15 minutes presentation, something like 15 minutes of questions. Really, the intent here is to is to you know, as the audit committee fulfilling its full charter of oversight of risk control, governance, et cetera, to be able to get a little bit more context about um, some of the, the risks at the council and hear from other people than just our audit team um, all the time. So we'll, we'll still plan on doing presentations of our audit work. We're trying to think about how that's gonna look. Maybe it'll be a little more streamlined and we'll just highlight some of the findings rather than going through everything. Uh, but certainly um, would love to hear from committee members uh, about you know, if there's any ideas about topics or, um, you know, the type of presentation you might uh, want to hear um, uh, or people you would like to hear from, um, we can certainly work on that and, and update the schedule as we, as we uh, need to. So with that, um, I'm going to stop talking for a minute, get a drink of water and take any questions. And uh, um, and then if there are, if when we're complete with that, we'll ask for approval of the audit plan. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate all of that information. I'll turn it over to the committee. Are there any questions? Want further information or any additional information? Councilmember Galswick. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, just a couple of clarifications here, <clears throat> Matt, if you if you would. Uh, so, you mentioned that not all of these audits are necessarily high risk. That there's kind of a high, medium, low. Um, and I think that makes sense. I'm, I'm a proponent of doing audit work, even in low risk areas, because everywhere you know, needs at least have that um, possibility of being audited. But is there a breakdown of that? Do you have that you know, broken down for these particular audits? And then this kind of ties to my second question of recognizing that you have built an audit plan that goes beyond your, your resources. Are you prioritizing the high risk audits or are there some particular audits on this list that you would say, you know, we for sure know that these are our eight biggest priorities. We got to get to these this year. And then the rest are kind of, you know, what we kind of think of at the university as tier two, where, you know, we might swap these out or we might do depending on timing or whatever it might come out. So kind of a two part question there. Sure. Uh, committee member, member Galswick, uh, members of the committee. So, um, as far as a breakdown, yeah, we have a risk register that has all of our business units aligned with our scores, and then it attaches to what the selected audit work is. Um, and so it, it it does tie out to where that risk level went. Now, like the business unit has kind of a comprehensive, like um, a, a, the risk is, is, is set at the business unit level. So the, the audits like don't directly tie to that specific risk as the number, but they are aligned if that makes some sense. So we do think of it that way. Um, although um, the, it's not exactly a one-to-one, -one. like the audit isn't exactly a one-to-one, -one, like the line on the risk register, if that makes sense. Yeah. Is that kind of getting at your question? Um, somewhat. Uh, so, And I'm happy to share this too with you if, you, if you're ever interested in going over it. Yeah, I, I might be just to kind of get some understanding. If, if So if I'm understanding you correctly, there's a, a risk register associated with, with each of these units, but it doesn't tie, or each of these audits, but it doesn't tie directly because sometimes those risk registers are not, you know, tied out to the specific type of uh, activity or area that you're looking at, following that correctly? Yeah, let me think of an example quickly. Like, our risk register ties to like regional administration finance is the business unit. So we'll talk to them as a, as a unit um, and discuss risk at their overall level. Now they have a number of different business processes that they own. One of which is payment processing collection. Mm -hmm. So within our conversation, we'll talk about why that's a higher risk item. And we will identify that within that conversation on that line as a potential audit that we'll look at. And, but the rating is tied to RA finance as a whole because of, they also do payroll and they do um, budgeting and they do, you know, so like um, it, it's been a balance of, you know, how do we figure out how to exactly tie our risk register across and identify the audits and have it all linked. So it's, I'd say it's still a little bit of a work in progress, but to an extent, everything, all the selected audits or proposed ones are tied to that uh, business unit that has, and, and that's how we determine the risk. 
if that helps. Yeah, just real quick follow up on this, Chair Justin. Sure. Um, so, yeah, other than the tour, I think the way I'm thinking about it is I'd be interested in just what your opinion is on these particular activities and if you see these as high risk or, or medium or low. Um, I understand you're using the risk registry in the background to, to try to inform that. But to your point, maybe you're looking at a slice of this that really is not that big of a risk, but you think we need to get to this year, even if it's a high risk area. Um, yeah, I would just be interested in what the kind of risk makeup is of from your perspective on, on these audits. And again, so to the second part of that question, does that inform then, you know, are you trying to spend your resources on the ones that you think are highest risk or are there just some activities that you think we really have to get to even if they're not necessarily the highest risk item right now? Sure, I think and I think this gets to your question about priority. So it's I'll answer kind of both at the same time. It there are I think it's a balance between in some cases. Like I'll highlight the M Cub as an example. I'd say it's fairly high risk. It hits equity, hits financial. There's a good a lot of good reasons why it's important for us to take a look at this program. Um, part of the reasons prioritized is, is what I tied back to, which is like it doesn't really have any other audit coverage because it's a council led program. Uh, so the FDA is not going to look at it. It's not really a state auditor responsibility. So for us, it falls a little bit higher, even if it's not as big of a deal, like as a as a um, from a financial standpoint, as some of our capital projects are, uh, where there's a lot of it's directly like Southwest. A single change order at Southwest can be larger than you know many of these, like this whole list combined. Um, and that's all we would do if we just focus entirely on financial risk. So it's it's the balance between those things. So there's a couple of these that are. Haven't had some attention for a while. Um, that's that time since last audit. If we haven't touched on something, if it doesn't have other audit coverage, uh, we might prioritize it first. So, like that's an area that we're we're working on right now. Uh, MCO was actually on the audit plan last year, and we we we're getting underway this month with with that project. Uh, job classification is another one that just with a lot of changes in um, in the environment, the risk environment around hiring. Uh, it seems like a, a project that we wanted to tackle sooner rather than later. So it's a, it's a delicate balance of like what's prioritized, um, and it's a bit fluid. Um, it, when we start getting close to the end of uh, a team with the audit work, we'll start to think about what's next. Um, you know, we'll kind of take a fresh look at the audit plan. Like, what are these? What what items on here um, might have had an increased risk profile? Uh, we might have heard something that there is a, you know, this is just kind of ear to the ground audit stuff that you hear, you know, there, oh, there's been some glitchy things with that program for a while, or somebody had a bad experience with it um, internally. So, um, certainly art more than science. I don't, you know, if we've uh, technically, I think in the the risk register, we, we do categorize things. I mean, the scores are kind of attached to a high, medium, and low, depending on whether it comes out like a two, you know, two or higher or a one or higher. Um, but I think the selection of the audit plan is a little bit more nuanced and takes into account all mm -hmm. the factors, um, you know, throughout the year, so. Anything else? Um, so, again, and sorry to keep asking this question, but um, just to clarify then, is there, is there any kind of bifurcation or is there a grouping of the, on this list that you really think you know, these are the most critical ones, or is it, or is this kind of the, or is it more of a, what do I say, like a menu, that these are the types of one, these are the audits you will be going through uh, over the course of the year that you may select from? Um, I would say there is, there is some priority here. I think there are some, some audits that I think we'll, we'll for sure be getting to. There is, I will highlight that there is some nuance. Um, it's not attached to the plan, but we have, as I've mentioned in other meetings, we've had we have a, a, a new group that's focusing on capital projects. It's just that's and they have some other responsibilities, cyclical audits, but it's it's a new effort within our team to focus on the capital projects, things like change orders, pay applications, uh, the post implementation review of capital projects. You know what happens all the stuff when we're done. Um, so. And then we have our IT team that is focused a little bit more on just those projects that have, they relate to IT. So there's. You know, within each group, there's kind of a uh, what, we're, what we're really hoping to get to. Um, you know, going forward too is just here is your priority list. Here's the next three up. Now with capital projects, there it's a it's a new group, it's a new effort. So there's a little bit of we want to touch gold line. We haven't done anything with gold line. We want to make sure we're getting to purple line at some point. Um, so there's a bit of distribution around just making sure that. 
we're, we're getting into a project, getting to know some of the staff that are working on it because there's new project directors all the time. And, and so there's a bit of that that goes on too with, within uh, groups within our team, if that makes okay. sense. So. Okay. Thank you. And Matt, just for those of us who don't live and work in the world of audit every day, um, if there is just a simple way to asterisk or, you know, just mark the maybe ones that would be a special note for one reason or another that I think was highlighted in the discussion just now, maybe that's something to, to add going forward just so that we go, oh, yeah, I remember that was the because of the and had the backstory of this or something like that. That's all. Councilmember Barber, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Mine's a little more in the weeds. So um, I have a question just about the uh, the body worn camera um, audit. So this is a for the others. This is a new program for us, which means new policies and procedures. And so I'm kind of curious: Are you auditing against the policies and procedures, or are you looking at usage of the body cameras and you know things like data storage and and data security and that type of thing? Because it's much easier if we need to change any of those policies and procedures to do it earlier in the program. And so I'm kind of wondering what you're looking at so that we can look and make sure that we have the right program in place. Uh, Councilman Barber, members of the committee, uh, the answer to all that is yes. I mean, that is, you know, it's, we, we spoke to the state auditor about what their process. So the state auditor does this for other entities um, and they have a written audit program. And they wouldn't share that in whole with the whole cloth with us, but they did go over in general what it is. And it does touch on exactly what you said. Are the policies and procedures in place? Is there data retention? Is there data security? Um, are we saving? So if we did a sample of days with, you know, and pulled a random sample of officers, could we get that data from those days? Um, so all of those are components of it. We, you know, I think what we'll do is again with our engagement level risk assessment, we'll look at all of these processes and identify those highest risk areas. Or um, we'll certainly start with policies and procedures um, in terms of making sure that they're in place. And that really is the intent um, of our work here is to um, get an initial look. Um, the state auditor needs at least two years of data to start. That's why they won't do it this year. Um, and so it's a kind of a good opportunity for us to get that initial look. And try to make some improvements um, and make some recommendations if we need to in advance of that regular state audit coming up. Great. I'm glad to hear we're doing that ahead of the state audit. That's good. Good to hear. Thank you. Great question. Are there any other questions? Anything else the committee wants to discuss on this item? Well, Matt, thank you very much for putting this together. Thanks to the whole team. Thanks to the whole organization because everybody is wrapped into this and working to ensure that as we look towards a very, very robust plan for 2022, knowing that we probably can't get to all of it, but just recognizing the lift that goes into all of it and um, the importance of the work and all of your diligence in putting this plan together. I really appreciate that. Hearing no other discussion on this item, then I would uh, request a uh, Motion to approve and a second. Uh, moved by Barber. And is there a second? Seconded by Road Clerk. It's been moved and seconded. Again, any further discussion? Seeing none, then roll call vote, please. Barber? Aye. Galswick? Aye. George? Aye. Jorgensen? Aye. Lee? Aye. Roffler? Aye. Bento? Aye. Johnson? Aye. And that is unanimous. So again, thanks for all that great work. Appreciate it. Let's move on to the next portion of our agenda, which is information. Again, I'll turn this over to Matt for the director's report and the annual audit report. All right, Madam Chair, members of the committee. So my last item for the day. Um, I'm going to go through my director's report really quickly because there's a lot of overlap with the annual report um, and some duplication with our uh, what I just talked about. So, um, uh, just a departmental update. Um, uh, now that we have our strategic plan and our audit planning process are complete for the next year, we're going to focus on implementation, implementation, and execution. So, uh, really filling out the strategic plan. What are the action items we're going to do and prioritize some of those things for 2022? So that's kind of the next step. 
Um, you know, and as I mentioned at the, with some of the not audit work plan items on the audit plan, we still need to fill out some of those things and figure out what are our priorities. Um, and then we also have to make some decisions about um, filling some existing uh, positions that we have open and um, also potentially uh, looking at uh, down the road of whether there's potential growth within the audit team to address things like our, you know, our IT areas or capital projects. So that's something that we'll work with uh, regional administration to, um, to, to do in the, in early in the new year. Um, as always, I'll just give my quick COVID update and continue to work from home for the most part. Um, some of us are coming in periodically, but not a uh, terribly regular basis. Um, and uh, my disclosure that I continue to work on the incident command structure um, in the role of planning chief for Robert Street. Um, uh, and we'll continue to do so likely until the end of the pandemic. Uh, the workload on that, at least for me, is, is ebbed a bit um, toward the end of the year. Uh, had some uh, quite a bit of activity with the, the Delta increase and some uh, requirements around uh, vaccinations and testing. And there's still a few responsibilities I have, but the, the hours have gone down a little bit on that front. Um, I spoke about the external audits already. Um, you'll hear about uh, some of the recently completed projects today, uh, and we also have our um, local agent security officer contract review. That, that audit is complete. We're just waiting for some management responses, so you'll hear about that at our next meeting. Um, just wanted to highlight ongoing projects, so this is really kind of that initial swath of projects that we'll, we'll be working on in the next, uh, early in the next year, and are already really started in earnest on these projects. Uh, one about MnDOT funding agreements. What about job classification process, the paper check processing, um, North Star, uh, which is an annual kind of a, a process audit that we do every year, and Southwest uh, Light Rail Change Order Review, and also highlight our MCUB audit likely will be off the ground uh, relatively shortly as well. Um, I'm going to uh, skip the rest of the director's report because I think I'm going to be talking about most of it, what's left in the uh, annual audit report. Um, so I'm going to make an attempt uh, to just share this uh, document. Um, and this this came out um, in the materials. Um, so I still have that. Pardon me for just a second. Uh, Chair, can you see the audit report? Is that what's sharing right now? Yep, I can see it. Okay, all right. So um, we did this last in 2019. Uh, I should be uh, honest, it didn't get done last year in part because of the incident command structure. Um, and so this this version of it includes both 20 and 21. Um, and we're going to plan on doing this every year going forward um, and probably looking at um, some slight updates in terms of the format. but. Uh, basically, it's you know similar to what we've seen before. Is uh, some information about our committee and our team. Uh, one thing that I want to make sure I highlighted for the committee is, um, you know, I've mentioned we're working on our database um, and uh, trying to improve some of our, um, as it says in the strategic plan, work on some of our key performance indicators. So I'm highlighting um, in the report a analysis of how many projects we completed um, over 20 and 21. Um, I think uh, just a note here, um, one of the things we're trying to square away a little bit is uh, you, may, you may have noticed that there aren't any consulting projects specifically listed in the audit plan this year. I'm really, uh, historically, we, we had more consulting projects on our audit plan. I'm really trying to get away from doing consulting unless it's explicitly requested by management. Um, we didn't have any of those this year. So uh, trying to focus more on having everything come through be, a, be an audit and adhere to audit standards. So, um, but within the plan uh, over the last couple of years, um, these are the metrics in terms of completion. Um, it's a little bit um, complicated just by the fact that with a rolling plan, um, the percentages probably are lower than what we actually completed because some items appeared on both plans. So, and we had a few projects that are uh, like like contract administration that we we didn't specifically work on, but we did do some contract audits through the year. So um, we're, we're one of the, the focus areas for 2022 is going to be to get this part of the, the follow up to be a little bit better in terms of 
you know, being clear with the audit plan what we completed and what we what we're still working on or what we dropped. But here's these are the metrics for the year. Um, and then I just also highlight the uh, follow up with um, tracking recommendations. So within the database, we now have the information. It's still we're still working on like getting the reporting functions. But I had some people work going to the on the team go in and uh, look through our past years of work to identify how many of the recommendations we've made and how many are still open. Um, and we'll plan to do this, uh, some version of this, probably an improved version of this, actually more frequently than just annually, um, uh, probably at every meeting. So um, just wanted to highlight that for the, for the committee. I know the follow-up has been an important area for this committee, and uh, we continue to work on uh, uh, making sure that this is, uh, uh, um, that we're continuing to follow up. I also will note that on the audit plan, we added eight areas uh, that we plan to follow up in uh, specifically. So we're actually allotting some time uh, within the audit plan uh, to ensure that we're making coming back around on topics that we have open recommendations. So I um, want to highlight that for the committee. Um, there's some information about some of our process improvement practices um, that we're continuing to work on, uh, a list of some of the accomplishments we've done over the last couple of years, uh, some special projects, um, and some information about looking ahead. So uh, just want to go through that quickly. Um, I don't have, this isn't a business item, so uh, no need for a vote, but I will take any questions that anybody has. Thanks, Matt. Are there any questions from the committee? Madam Chair, this is Andra. I have a question for Matt. Matt, on the chart we were just looking at, do when you say recommendations, does that equate to a finding? Or are there multiple recommendations associated with the finding? Uh, uh, committee member uh, Rolfler, uh, Madam Chair, uh, there is typically um, more recommendations per finding. So sometimes we have a, a couple of recommendations for every finding. Sometimes it addresses um, uh, a, a couple different areas within a finding. So I would say that in general, I'd have to guess and eyeball this, but it'd be something like two recommendations per finding is probably typical. Okay. Um, I'll say this, I would like to probably, um, one of my goals for 2022 is to maybe reduce the number of recommendations we have um, and make them a little bit more targeted. I think sometimes we end up with too many. It becomes a little bit challenging for a manager to have, you know, 12 recommendations to respond to instead of maybe three or four. So. Um, that is something that I would like to uh, focus on next year. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Can you remember Galswick? Thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, I'll do the two, two questions um, kind of unrelated here. One on the follow up piece that you were just talking about. I want to clarify are you planning on doing follow up on all recommendations, or is there, again, some sort of bifurcation between higher risk or lower risk ones? Um, and then my second question is related to ethics point, but maybe I'll just see if you can answer the first question here and follow up first. Sure, could you remember Galswick? Uh, we, um, the list of projects we have in our follow up list specifically, I would say in general, it's probably higher risk items. Um, in some cases, uh, let's see, in some cases it's because um, the, um, there was a need for a business to implement a, a change in process. And we want to consider retesting to make sure that the change had the effect that um, it was intended. Um, in some cases, it's um, areas that um, we just haven't heard about for a while because it was, you know, it's been a couple of years since we made the recommendations and there hasn't been a lot of activity. We want to have more of a formal, you know, do we need to do more audit work here? Um, so I think the follow-up is going to range a little bit in terms of whether it's a simple. I mean, to answer your first question, we will follow up. We always make at least a check to see if, like, some activities been like when we look at the recommendations were closed. I mean, all of those we we confirm that the policy was written, the procedure was done. Um, these are a little bit more probably that that I would I would say generally that higher risk area where. I, I think um, it's important to kind of follow up to make sure that like the, the, the risk has actually been mitigated, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and not just in some cases, it's easy to look and say, well, there is a there is a procedure so we can expect that that risk has been mitigated. You know, and we talk about it just generally more in our, in our risk assessment discussions every year. These are more. Well, there's there's probably reason to, to focus on it a little bit more, um, more explicitly. 
Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that makes sense to me, to me, to it. So thinking about it as you're going to follow up on all of your, all the items, it's just the depth in which you go. There might be some in which are due to the risk or due to the nature of you might have to do more than just confirming the procedures are in place or, or whatever it might be. And that, that makes sense. To, to my ethics point question, I was wondering if, and I know it's still early, so I'm not surprised we don't really have this yet, but if eventually if you're thinking of providing some summary statistics to the board um, or to the committee, I should say, you know, providing some info just on how many, how many reports have you received, how many have been substantiated in some way. I know we won't want to get into the specific details in this sort of forum, but you know, just to kind of get some sort of feel of what's out there. Um, if you've had any thought on that or if you're working with any other units to either put that together or related to the response to some of these ethics points, uh, reports that come in. Yeah, committee member goes with members of the committee. Yeah, it's a conversation like yesterday, literally on this exact topic. Uh, and it really is, I think, exactly what you just said. It's it's trying to track as complaints come in. And one of the things we're really trying to work on is, is I think the teams that respond to these complaints are confident that something happened with every one of them. Now, is it always an investigation and a termination? No, but we we do something. So it's categorizing what those actions are and in a way that we can share, because we cannot share, um, if somebody's terminated, it's still protected until it's uh, completely disposed of, uh, the final disposition of the action, which is our all the way through arbitration. So oftentimes we can't talk about those actions for quite a while. Um, and I, I, that's just data practices law. Like we don't really have a choice there, but you know, to what extent can we tell our story about what we are doing to respond to complaints as they come in? Um, I think would, would go a long way to giving our, our staff, uh, our, our committee and our, our board confidence that we're, we're handling those appropriately. So that's exactly what we're working on. Um, I, it's, it, it is a good time right now, one year out. We've all had a chance to work through with the system, with cases, see how it works. We're trying to refine some of the back end, you know, getting the categories right, setting expectations about how to enter information into the system so we can do that reporting and rely on it. So um, I, I'm hoping this year we'll, we'll finally get to a place where we have something we can share. I think the goal is sometime Q1 or Q2 to get something drafted, so. Great. Are there any other questions? I just wanna do a follow-up too on um, the items that were brought up. So I really do appreciate um, committee member Galswick bringing this up because I've thought about this too. And I think Matt, you're used to us now. We've been together for long enough where this committee um, to your point earlier about wanting to help bring um, a greater overview of risk assessment at the council and bringing in speakers. And as we discussed prior to this meeting, having some meat on the bone too, so that, you know, it's it's easy and I understand because I serve in a director role in my day job, it's easy to tell a board or a committee kind of the stuff that's going along in, 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 a, in a very positive light. And of course that that's wonderful, but I think, this committee is trying to really better understand, you know, um, where and how the focus is placed and where the, the risk might lie, of course, with confidence and um, everything that you're doing, but just trying to better understand, um, you know, with the kind of behind the scenes, how it's working. And I think maybe that goes to this point as well with um, uh, ethics point in place, like you said, for a year. It's interesting because I think we were very excited uh, to have this tool across the council, whether we're council members or committee members. Um, it's a very good thing. And just, you know, even some sort of rating, uh, trying to better understand in, in categories. I think maybe this is what committee member Gals was saying, you know, the types of complaints that are coming in, like 25% typically are in this area and 50% are in this area or what have you. And not to get into the, um, protected data of, of any of it, but to just understand, uh, is it doing what we wanted it to do? Um, are we feeling that we're getting the results that we need to? Um, so that the the um, overarching uh, goals are being met. So I know you're working on that. And um, I'm, I, I just, I, I'm sensing that for some time and and up until this meeting, the committee, I think would appreciate that kind of information when you can get it to us, so. I'm just uh, seconding what committee members are saying here today. Is there anything else on this report? All right, seeing none, excellent job, Matt, again, to you and your team across the council. Thank you very much for all of this work and putting this together.
And without further ado, we will move on to the second item of information, which is the Metro Transit System Safety Audit. And who from this wonderful list of talented and exceptional people will be leading us through this audit? Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, that uh, team will be myself, Nicholas Jelinek, uh, and then my co my teammates, uh, Timothy Larson and Tunde Ogungabasan. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, one moment as I pull up the PowerPoint, Madam Chair. Right. All right, and uh, here we go. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, myself and my team, we are here to pre present the results of the Metro Transit System Safety Audit. And with that, I will turn it over to Tunde to kick us off. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Madam Chair, members, good afternoon. A little background uh, on safety. In July 2018, the FDA published the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, Final Rule 49 CFR 673. Compliance deadline for the final rule has shifted several times, most recently to July 2021, primarily because of COVID-19. Now the final rule requires agencies like the Metropolitan Council that receive FTA funds to develop safety plans, including processes to implement safety management systems. And it also requires these agencies to retain safety plan re uh, related documentation and records for a minimum of three years after creation. There is an ASP for bus, there is an ASP for rail. The North Star Commuter Rail is not subject to 49 CFR 673 as it is governed by the FRA and thus a different set of rules. Now, the Minnesota Office of State Safety Oversight, aka Minosa, is the FDA designated state safety oversight agency and is thus responsible for conducting the triennial, triennial audit of the Metro Transit Light Rail. Last or most recent audit was conducted in September through October of 2020. And doing its part on safety, the Metropolitan Council has developed HR 9-1A, and this procedure identifies safety in health programs currently in use at the Metropolitan Council. Most of these programs are required by OSHA. All right, um, uh, about our objectives, our review had three main objectives. To determine bus safety plan compliance with the final rule and to ensure that the uh, retention regimen is maintained as required. Also to follow up on corrective action plans that result from uh, Minoso's 2020 triennial audit of light rail safety. And finally, to assess the strategies deployed in the implementation of Metro Transit's safety program and its adherence to HR 9-1A. Uh, the scope of the review covered the most recent agency safety plans for both bus and rail. Our review is limited to Metro Transit operations. All right. To help us assess compliance with the final rule, we reviewed as I said before, the most current agency safety plans. We looked at the safety department's internal safety audit program plan. We took a gander at Minosa's audit report and Minosa's cap tracking log, amongst a host of other supporting documents. Audit also conducted phone interviews with 
safety staff and additionally audit visited the Nicolette and Haywood garages. I will now hand off to Timo for some more on our observations. Timo. Thank you, Tunde. Uh, so quickly, just to go over um, non-finding observations or just areas that were part of this audit that didn't rise to uh, the level of a finding. So uh, we found that the council's agency safety plan did include those elements required by 49 CFR 673, which includes things like safety risk management, safety assurance, and safety promotion. Uh, we found that Metro Transit did implement those corrective action plans uh, that were recommended by Minasso. And just generally, the corrective action plans that Metro Transit has are consistently docu documented through these consolidated hazard matrices, which we found to be a good practice that promotes accountability and follow-up. Uh, we also found that there is a useful practice or regimen in place uh, for capturing or documenting and recording uh, safety-related incidents uh, through the use of OSHA 301 forms and the OSHA 300 logs. Uh, and then finally, we went and dug into the HR 91A procedure, and we found that Metro Transit does have all the necessary programs, procedures, and elements uh, that are appropriate to them. And that includes things like right to know program, a bloodborne pathogen program, uh, having a safety committee, or emergency action plans. Another component of that is some of the training requirements in there, and we were able to find the training materials and the records of tr trainings that actually took place. With that, I will turn it over to Nick to go over through or to go through observations. Thanks, Tim. And uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, we're going to present these a little bit differently than we have in the past uh, for the sake of time. In this case, we will present to you, we wanted to highlight two uh, findings and three recommendations that go along with them. Uh, in every case, management has agreed with the findings and are working on addressing the recommendations. So. Uh, the first one was that the documentation for the agency safety plans was generally maintained. However, there were two exceptions. Uh, the first exception was the commercial date driver's license daily checks. Uh, this is a, um, a set of documents that and a control that we run each day as part of our safety plan. Um, what happened was the in order to run these uh, checks, we have to go through a state of Minnesota system. The state changed their system, and as a result, the council was uh, locked out from accessing the, the system it needed in order to do these checks. Uh, so the effect of that is that our CDLs have not been regularly checked uh, since May, which has created uh, a liability risk for us. The second uh, documentation issue was surrounding the hazard analyses. Uh, the cause for this was that our agency safety plans do not set parameters for when the hazards should be evaluated, and it also does not describe how the hazards should be documented. So what the effect was, it, of this was that there is an increased injury uh, compliance and liability risk for the council and our staff. There's the appearance of randomness of when we are going to uh, formally evaluate a hazard versus when we don't. And then there's the compliance risk as well, which is not meeting the uh, federal documentation requirements set forth in 49 CFR Part 673. So uh, in order to address these issues, the two recommendations, which, as I said before, that management has agreed, agreed with, are to complete the interagency agreement with the state of Minnesota, which would allow us to access the system and then return to completing regular CDL checks and then the second part here is to create and implement a procedure for documenting the hazard analysis. Um, and then I will turn this back over to Tim. Thank you, Nick. So our final observation had to do with some housekeeping concerns that we had or observed when we performed our on-site visits. And these included things like there was an employee's lunch and personal effects on a workbench along with other equipment and pieces and parts. Uh, there were some stands behind a CNC machine that posed a potential tripping hazard. Um, there was another workspace that had empty boxes, packaging material, and trash on it, right below a sign that says, please do not leave any trash on this table. Um, so when we were trying to, or we were discussing trying to get at the root cause of this, it was hard to do because it was, we couldn't get to who the 
responsible person was. But in the case of the, the person with their lunch and personal effects on the, the workbench, it's believed that this person was trying to adhere to the COVID-19 restrictions and social distancing. Um, and so they took their, their break outside of the, the designated area. Another contributing factor may be that there's no formal uh, housekeeping organizational method in place. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry, the, the effect of this obviously is that the employees, um, there's a potential that the employees or their coworkers can become or in, be injured or harmed. And so we made a few recommendations versus the safety specialist should work with the owners of those areas to get it cleaned, organized, and then discuss how it's going to be maintained going forward. And then management should determine a method that allows employees to take their breaks in a designated area and complies with the COVID-19 restrictions. And then finally, management may want to consider or look into following a formal workplace organizational or housekeeping method. And then with that, we will open it up for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions from the committee? Any questions at all? Madam Chair, this is Andra. Um, thank you very much for the presentation um, to the team and um, for including the effect statements associated with your observations. Um, uh, well, I wonder if we could see the slide again. I don't have it in front of me, but I, I just want to make sure um, it, it, it would be helpful, for example, when you say there's a, the um, effect is that we might not be in compliance. If you could just take it a step further and maybe talk about what the implications of that is. So that's sort of the risk, but the effect might be that um, the council loses funding or um, kind of the impact to the organization of, of having um, you know, a, uh, a finding or identified risk in the, a particular area. I hope that made sense. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, committee member uh, Rothler, yes, that does make sense. Uh, to answer your question, in this case, we are risking a, we would be risking a finding in our FTA triennial. Uh, the requirement is that we maintain the documents that we set forth in our uh, agency safety plans and in this and in this case uh, we were not so and when we have a finding in that triangle audit what is the consequence of that uh madam chair i would actually defer to uh director latour on this one uh madam chair members of the committee um I, I would I would say that our triennial is wrapped up with all of the funding we get from the federal government or the federal transit administration. Um, you know, typically findings within a uh, triennial are um, handled um, just with follow up. Uh, we usually close them with the FTA. Um, it, it typically wouldn't affect our our, our funding. However, um, certainly um, it has the potential to. I mean, they are our funding partner um, and. Um, it's part of the reason that they do uh, compliance reviews uh, with um, with uh, regard to all of these topics. Uh, there is also always, you know, the, the risk of the Office of Inspector General from the FTA um, could um, review compliance issues and ask for uh, federal funds to be returned. So this is usually with financial matters, but um, oh, there always does carry that risk. Madam Chair, Matt, thank you very much. And just a, uh, just continuing on that. So, Matt, is that something that should be added in as part of the effect so that it goes that extra step as a consequence or or would that not be unnecessary just to make it explicit to anybody who's reading? Yeah, Madam Chair, it's we actually just did a, our team did a training. It was after this audit was completed. Um, but we were talking about exactly that point of like, what does a compliance risk really mean to us? Because compliance is um, compliance risk is is just that compliance. But what is the potential? Like, what could the the entity actually do? And, and to be punitive to us uh, if we're out of compliance? So, it is something that um, we we have talked about as a team is getting past that base level of just what is compliance, but what is the potential down downstream effect of that compliance issue um, as the effect? So it. Um, 
it's a good point. I'm glad you brought it up because it's actually uh, timely something we've been working on um, in, in our internally as a team. You know, unless the committee would desire otherwise, I, I think if you could work towards that, especially for our work on the committee, it really helps us to better understand, um, you know, the real life consequences for those that are either on the committee or those of us that serve on the committee and as council members. So um, I'm glad you guys are discussing that internally and thinking about that. And, you know, everything that we're doing is, uh, you know, trying to get again, limit and minimize risk, but also, um, you know, make sure that there aren't dire consequences or, or uh, unfortunate consequences um, across that spectrum of things that could happen to the council that eventually impacts service and our citizens. So we would appreciate, uh, you know, knowing, knowing more about that when these come forward for sure. And then I just had a quick question too. So this this um, audit, if I'm understanding and reading correctly, by Minoso took place in October, September, and October of 2020. Is that when it was completed? Um, Madam Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, the exact completion date is kind of escaping right me right now. Is uh, Andrew is uh, acting safety director Brody on the call. Yes, I am. Um, oh, what was the question? The question was, you know, um, on page 5 of this uh, report under introduction and background. Um, it said that the triennial audit uh, was performed in September and October of 2020. Is that when it commenced or was that when it was completed or um, just trying to get an idea of of how long the scope of the audit was, how long it took, because as I look at the timetable under the um, response and recommendations um, for items one and two, we've still got until July 31st, 2020 for, for it to be addressed or corrected, unless it already has been, and this is just the deadline by which we have to meet that day, because I see on the spreadsheet it says follow up action confirmation but i think i'm hearing that there's still work that needs to be done on item three on the spreadsheet from page 13 on that action item we go until march 31st of 2022 so i'm just trying to understand when the audit commenced when it was finished the um, recommendations were revealed and then we start working with team members to correct and address them and then how we report that back. And maybe that's all been completed ahead of these dates, but it just feels like they're they're not completed yet. But maybe I'm misunderstanding. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, yeah, I, I would have to check on the actual date as to when it was completed. I know there is one out, outstanding item and it's not necessarily a finding. It is a recommendation by our oversight office, state safety oversight office. And that is a safety statement slash slogan. Um, again, it wasn't a finding, it was um, a recommendation um, through the audit, but I believe all the other items have been completed from the Minosa audit. Okay. And the last audit, I actually just got word, the last audit uh, was completed through August, September of this year, 2021. So it, it has been completed. We just have one uh, follow-up item from that audit. Okay. Great. I, and again, I, I think because I don't do this for a living, um, I'm just trying to understand when it says the audit was performed and we're looking at fall of 2020, just how that plays out over the span of potentially more than a year and a half. But I can take that offline with Matt afterwards too, unless anyone else cares to listen to but this, but it, it's fine. I'm just trying to understand, I guess, the cadence and the rhythm of how these work and how they end up getting completed is all. Okay. Madam Chair, we can certainly take this offline, but I'll just I'll say that the uh, Minoso does uh, work uh, on a regular basis with us. Uh, typically, they're on site for a few days, and the um, at the exit conference when they're on site, there is a list of um, action items to to be completed. So it's it's typically like when they I'm, I need to check, but I, I'm fairly certain when we say they were on site, it was a brief on site with those findings and recommendations being issued at the time. Um, but we can we can take that discussion offline if you want more detail on exactly how that works. Okay, yeah, I would appreciate that. And again, just 
just reading it, I'm like, okay, it was completed in 2020. This must be about a year's long process because we've got deadlines going into 2022. So I'm just trying to understand the span of it when it seems like perhaps some of this was pretty straightforward once the recommendations came forward. But I don't want to take more time from today. Are there any questions from the committee that you'd like to add regarding the Metro Transit Safety System evaluation and audit? All right, hearing none. Um, the only other just notation we've got on our agenda today, and thank you everybody. I appreciate that all of you for um, putting that uh, presentation together, like the new format um, and how you how you presented that to us. So very much appreciated. Um, moving on, just a note, our next scheduled audit committee meeting uh, tentatively is set for February 15th of 2022. And that comes uh, to the end of our uh, business that we'll take uh, today in this um, public forum. And I would um, look to council member Lee for a motion to close the meeting and go into closed session regarding an audit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I move that this meeting be closed to the public pursuant to Minnesota statute section 13D.05 subdivision 3B. So the committee can discuss data classified as not public. Thank you, uh, Council Member Lee. Is there a second? Is there a second? Vento seconds. Thank you, Council Member Vento. No discussion on this. All those in, or should we do roll call vote, Tammy, on this as well? That's correct, Chair Johnson. Let's do a roll call. Barber? Aye. Galswick? Aye. George? Aye. Jorgensen? Aye. Lee? Aye. Roffler? Aye. Bento? Aye. Johnson? Aye. And um, we will close this meeting and there will be no other meeting, uh, no other items to come before us after this closed session. So once it's over, we'll have completed our work for uh, today's meeting. So everybody hang on and we'll move into closed session.